Hi everyone, welcome to Inventive Mind. My name is Kayani. Thank you for joining me today. Um, if you have joined my channel before, if this is your first time, welcome. And this is a um, channel for creatives, the communities out there for professionals and students and up and coming people who are trying to figure things out. So I bring uh, interview guests that I find very interesting. And if you have joined before, you know I'm an intellectual property and business law attorney. And that means I do trademarks, copyright patents, and I work with for me forming businesses like Benefit Corporation, Co LLCs and C Corps and S Corps. So, um, you know, and part of my channel have been to bring forward interviews with other attorneys who do different type of laws or even do something similar but you know how they handle things and today's uh, interview guest is one of my really good uh, mentors and a friend and a colleague uh, Renee Stackhouse and she actually is amazing I actually met her when I was in law school she was already practicing um, attorney even though because this is my second career I came from science to law, so I actually started a little late. So um, I'm not trying to put you in an age category. That's why I'm saying. <laughs> Thank you for that. <laughs> so, so I, um, you know, so I, I looked up to Renee the way she was because I met her when I was first year law student, and I saw her how she's organizing events, and um, you know, we have become close throughout the year because years because now it's been 10 years almost since we have um, known each other. <laughs> so it's because of all the activities we do together, Renee is highly involved. So I will go through that and kind of go to her background. And uh, as with any uh, interviews, I say, you know, just keep in mind this is for informational purposes only. If you have a specific question, just, um, you know, I will put the information down below to how to connect with um, Renee and me. Um, so just keep that in mind. And thank you, Renee, for joining me today. Thanks, thanks um, for having me. I'm so excited. <laughs> yeah, I, I think, you know, I saw you started a new channel. M C L E. Um, I I saw you have been going uh, YouTube, um, uh, not YouTube, not just YouTube, Facebook Live, on that. And so I thought, you know, I need to bring you on to kind of talk about, you know, what I would like to talk about today is about how you lead things, how you join organizations, and you are very active in organizations you join how you select those and how you mentor others in the field as you are going through this. So, um, it, you know, so it's an open discussion. <laughs> okay. So, uh, we could start with what kind of attorney you are and how you decided to be that kind of attorney. Sure. So right now I practice uh, plaintiff's personal injury and I'm board certified in civil trial law by the National Board of Trial uh, Advocates. And I also do military defense, uh, and that's in military courts. So those things keep me busy uh, during my day job hours. Uh, and how did I get there? You know, in law school, I, as soon as you could intern, second semester, first year, I started interning. And I did a different internship every semester, trying things out, and I was like, family law, nope. Uh, you know. <laughs> insert practice area here, I did them all until I got to um, civil defense at Neil Dimot. And I was like, this is almost it. I like this, this is cool, oh, but, and then I ended up at Thor's Nose Bartolotta McGuire and I went, yeah, plaintiff side, this is what I like. This is what I wanna do. And so that's how I found my practice area. What made you wanna go into law from the, you know, did you always want it to be your attorney? <laughs> No, I uh, actually was a complete misfit in high school. Uh, I was the goth chick who uh, did not really care about school, which was awful because I went to a great high school um, and I had a great education. I just wasn't into it at that point and I didn't go to college right away. It was actually, um, okay, I'm going to do this without crying. It was actually when my grandfather passed away um, and I had to take care of my grandma who had always been a work at home mom and didn't have a job and didn't have income coming in anymore. So I flipped a coin and heads was law school and tails was an MBA. Cause I figured one of those yeah. has got to help me. 
Um, and it was ahead. So I took the LSAT two weeks later and jumped into law school knowing nothing about the law and desperately hoping it would work out. <laughs> Thank God for that coin. <laughs> <laughs> it was crazy. I don't recommend that as a way to get into the legal profession, but it's, um, I, you know, I think that's why we are having these open discussions, because I do like hearing these stories for people to realize that you could change the course of your life at any point, and kind of trying to change the way you do things. And like you said, you tried out different type of laws, and you kind of realize that's not it. It's kind of have a, this mixture, it's kind of like a recipe, right? and you keep making it until the recipe is perfect. So I, I, I'm a huge baking fan, so that's why I go to recipes, so just because that's how I am. It's perfect. And a scientist, being a scientist, I'm always like, you know, test and retest, <laughs> collect data, analyze, and yes. then draw conclusions, right? Um, so, um, you know, I think, um, so when you say you're a trial attorney, Renee, what does that entail for people who might be coming across who may not know what exactly that means? Sure. So I, uh, when I do my intake with a potential client, I don't take a case unless I'm comfortable taking that case all the way to a jury if I need to. Mm -hmm. And I always tell my clients, uh, you know, the goods and the bad about their case so that they understand where the struggles are going to be and what the weaknesses in the case are, because there's no such thing as a perfect case. Otherwise, they would have just thrown a bunch of money at you and it would be over anyway. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, we, we always talk about there's, here's the path to trial, but at the same time, we could settle the case if you want to at any point as well. So we're always working a parallel track of building a case up in case it gets to people. Um, and also that usually helps it settle at some point along the way too, because you're working the case up right. You're making sure you're building the strongest case you can. You're reaching out and using experts and making um, dis discovery inquiries and you know ultimately getting ready to say, hey, look, I get we have to fight about it. You're doing your job. I'm doing my job. Let's let 12 people figure it out. So um, I wanted to add this part to it. The reason I ask what does that mean is because I think we see things on TV and we think that's what an attorney is. Like Law and Note, I was a huge fan of Law and Note. Yeah. <laughs> and, and I didn't go into law because of that. I will just <laughs> actually stop watching Law and Note after I became an attorney because I kept on seeing all the problems with it. <laughs> um, so, <laughs> you know, like there's no way you're going to, you know, have a case, this moves, and then you go to trial and the jury come out. Everything happens in like, what, two weeks, it looked like. So, um, so oh, yeah. I think, <laughs> so that's why I want to kind of talk to people when I'm talking to uh, um, professionals, other attorneys and um, business people, I ask these questions that you are like, oh, that's, you know, we know what trial attorney is. Well, not exactly sometimes. So this is why I wanted to bring that up. And what does it mean to be certified a trial? Um, you said you are certified trial um, I forget the title, but what does that mean and what that certification, what, is that a special training? It, it is a, a test, another test. I swore I would never take another test after the bar. Uh, and apparently I forgot that short-term amnesia. Uh, but I uh, applied for it. California has specializations that you can get as a lawyer to show your skill level in something. And one of the ones they don't have, at least right now, is on civil trial law. And so I found a, a national organization that is approved by the ABA and also accepted by the State Bar of California. And that's the NBTA, the National Board of Trial Advocates. And they have a few different areas that you can uh, get a specialization in. And I took a, a test and then I had to put together information from every trial I've ever done, you know, opposing counsel, how many days was it, how many crosses and directs, and it was how many depositions. Uh, it was so intense. I, I, if I would give anybody a tip, it would be to start logging that stuff from the moment you start practice, instead of having to recreate it later. Uh, and so I submitted all of that and was approved last year. Uh, and I think off the top of my head, it's, a, it's either a three or a five year, I think it's five. Uh, three or five year before you have to recertify. Just for the record, how long have you been practicing law now <laughs> today? 
<laughs> uh, hang on, math. Uh, 12 years. 12 years. <laughs> yeah. So I've been practicing for six years. Like I said, law school is only three years. So, um, you know, and what Renee was saying. So um, with that, I she did mention ABA, uh, that means American Bar Association. I just want to put that, um, you know, we have a lot of acronyms, so I will oh, many. cover some of it. If I forget, you could always ask the question in the comments. So, okay. So with that, I wanted to get to all the activities that you do. So uh, because we are part of, I'm on the board with you on the um, San Diego Lawyer Magazine, which is part of the uh, of a county, San Diego County Bar Association's uh, publication. Um, but I also know you were the president of California, uh, what is that? <laughs> I'm like California Women Lawyers? California Women Lawyers. You are on the board of Lawyers Club of San Diego. So you've been in the national, international kind of and county, local level, state level, national, international roles um, throughout the, you know, your career, I would say. But so 15 years, really, if you look at law school, too, because I don't think of you as somebody who would not have been involved in law school. <laughs> so so um, how do you choose this organization and how do you find time to be active and how, what, what is your um, secret sauce? <laughs> so those are great questions. I, I pick organizations uh, that I'm passionate about. So what the mission statement is, is incredibly important to me because I know that if I don't love it and live it and breathe it, I'm just going to start resenting the work that I need to do on behalf of it. So I don't ever want to get there. So that's number one is pick something that motivates me. So Lawyers Club of San Diego, CWL, California Women Lawyers, La Raza Lawyers, um, the National Association of Women Judges, all of those things, uh, promoting diversity, promoting women in the law, um, hugely important to me. Uh, I think it's so necessary for us to revise what people imagine in their head when they think lawyer. So uh, that definitely has led me down that path in San Diego County Bar because I didn't know any lawyers before I joined law school. And the idea of meeting a lawyer or a judge was terrifying to me. And so to be able to give back to those law students who may not have had that experience to help them build practices and feel comfortable in the legal community to effectuate the change from the specialty bars into the greater bar association. I mean, all of that's just so important. So that's how I pick um, time. Uh, that's a tough one. I can I, I will just interject here that the reason I asked that is you're also mom your uh, son is how old is he now like he's, I know he's three years four three years, and a half yeah three and a half and um, you know you're like you're married you have um, you know this beautiful son and you know like you you actually bring your son to events I have even in the infant years I remember seeing that which I thought was amazing because I think like you said, it's changing the mindset, right? To show that you could do both. You could be effective doing both. Like you could be a mom and do this. And also you had to find balance somehow. So I think that's, that's the type of discussion I kind of wanted to like ask you, how do you find that time? Because it's not like time is something we could stretch in a way, right? So you had to really kind of plug it in. Well, I feel like uh, you, as a lawyer who's involved in the community, you get good at kind of stretching time, but uh, I, I live by my calendar, uh, which is great. And my husband, who is also a, a solo lawyer, share, we share calendars. So we're very cognizant of booking things and, okay, if you're scheduling that, then I won't schedule during this time so that we can always support each other, which is huge. Uh, some things, I, I love bringing my son to everything I can. One, to destigmatize the fact that, the, you know, most people feel like you have to choose between being a mom and a lawyer, which I hate. I don't think you do. Um, and, but I, but I also, I balance it with being careful about, I don't want him to distract from the event. So it's always a, a balance and knowing that if he is done with whatever we're at, I can say, here, dad, take him, you guys go for a walk, and I will continue being lawyer at this point. So very, very fortunate to have a support system in him. 
that allows me to be active and you know to um, share that time. And so that's really helped me be successful in planning, you know, or like today when I say, hey, I'm gonna do this great webinar with my friend and he says, cool, I've got the kiddo, have fun. And um, so I think other reason I wanted to chat with you is you're one of the um, leaders I have seen because we have worked in committees together that uh, where you were the committee chair and I seen you, how you lead things and I love it because you actually give a lot of leeway. You don't micromanage, which I really appreciate. So um, I wanted to talk about that leadership style. How do you, um, for anybody who's out there thinking about how they're running a group, how do you do things kind of your philosophy? Well, so I have to, first I reverse roles with the people I'm, I'm working with, right? And I hate being micromanaged. I mean, it's the worst. I, if you're gonna put me in a position, then trust me to do the work in the position. And that's what I wanna give to everybody else I work with. There's a reason this person was chosen as a leader or put in charge of something and it's because they have the skills and the competency to do it. So I'm all about letting people know, if you need help, I'm here for you. But otherwise, make this yours. Have fun with this, be creative, make it the most amazing thing you can possibly do within the scope of what you've been given, within the budget of what you've been given, and, and have a blast with it. Because at the end of the day, it's volunteer work most of the time, no one's getting paid for it, so you have to enjoy it. And if you're dreading the meetings, if you're dreading being told what to do, if you're dreading being involved, you're not gonna stay involved. You lose too many good people like that. So I think it's really important to foster that. Plus, then you're teaching people how to lead themselves so that they can continue up the ladder of leadership. I think your style have actually have inspired me to be a little more hands off because I think as I think the one of the challenges is that you know I hate being micromanaged, but at the same time I think sometimes people who are like me tend to also because we we are all perfectionists too, right? We have our because we are professionals, we came to this level because of things we have done. Then you also have things where you kind of want to do things certain way and you kind of see it a better way. Um, so it's kind of also having that patience and kind of drawing back because that's where I think your inspiration come from is not to be a micromanager. Yes, I think it's easy to be a micromanager if you're like in this level sometime, you know, because you just want to make it sure it's you, it's, it's, you know, represent what it could be, right? But when you give people space also, you let them, yeah, sometimes they will make a mistake or they may not be at the same level that you wanted them to, like you could have done it yourself, but it's also acknowledging that, you know, we had to grow, right? So. So much in there is, is yes. I mean, it, for me, it's when you were talking, the things that were raised was the thing Lelise always says to me, my friend Lelise, which is don't let, perfection get in the way of done. And I'm like, yes, right? Okay, it doesn't have to be perfect, it needs to be done. Uh, and I think you're exactly right. We are OCD and type A and we want it to be amazing and perfect. And sometimes you just gotta let it go and let it be done. Um, and, and then, yeah, sometimes people don't follow through or sometimes it's not exactly what you were hoping for it to be. But as a leader, you can't take on everybody else's stuff. You have to let them be responsible for it at the end of the day. And sometimes that means last minute getting involved and helping and, you know, helping it be successful. But the point is to remember that that's part of the team effort. And so that sometimes real life intervenes. Sometimes subcommittee leaders or committee leaders have something happen. Work raises its head. And you know what? People are lawyers first. This is, again, it's volunteer. So just being able to reach out to folks and say, hey, I got your back. We're gonna make it through it. And then the other thing is have two committee chairs so that if something does happen to one of them, they've got backup immediately built in. That's one of my things over the last few years is, is co-chairs <laughs> are amazing. So, um, you know, I, I think what you said, because I was writing a book chapter with you on one of the projects that we did together is um, for solo attorneys putting out how to do it, right? We are upgrading a, 
um, uh, edition of a book that's was that is going to be published by uh, California Lawyers Association (CLA). And I think you know, and then COVID happened, and I was just. Um, you know, my chapter, I remember I reached out to you and I said, I'm so sorry, I'm not making this deadline because there's like sub deadlines, you know, that we had. And um, because I just wasn't in that mental space and I had to say, you, I, I'm grateful for the feedback you sent. You're like, yeah, you're going to get it done. Don't worry. Like we got this. And even that was enough to kind of like get that out of that mindset of the COVID fatigue, <laughs> I would call it, and to just get to that, okay, I could do this. And other part of what I think sometimes people don't realize is, and I had this amazing professor undergrad who trusted me with like in, my, in his research lab with a couple of huge projects. And, um, you know, and I think you and him, these kind of leaders who are not micromanaging, but also help support, is they inspire you to do better and you want to do a good job. <laughs> so I had to say, that, um, that's what I like about it. Like when you said that to me, I also had this mindset, well, I really cannot let Renee down too. I can like not meet the deadline, like the final deadlines and, you know, say, oh, oops, sorry. <laughs> like it's just not gonna. So I think, you know, end of the day, it's also that, having that relationship, that having that support network really do help everybody, yeah. you know, get it done. So, um, so with that, I wanted to ask a um, couple of things because I'm talking about mentorship, menteeship relationships, because you do mentor a lot of young attorneys and law students. What advice do you have for people who are mentoring people? And what advice do you have for the students who want to find a mentor or being mentor? Okay, let me think about that. So advice for the students looking for a mentor. Let me start with that. Mm -hmm. um, I would say definitely find one. I know that a lot of times lawyers go and speak at law schools and we say, please call me, email me, here's my card, get in touch. And then it's like crickets, chirp, chirp, chirp. Nobody calls. I would have I killed for that opportunity in law school to have a lawyer tell me that. So it just kind of blows my mind, like take us up on it, mm -hmm. number one. Um, and number two, don't do that random weird cold email, have never met you, but here's my resume, let's talk. Like mentorship doesn't work like that. That's just way too forced. Um, meet me in person at an event and then send me a follow-up and hey, we met here and then I'm, a, I'm intrigued. Oh yeah, I remember you. I remember meeting you and yes, great follow-up. I would love to spend some more time getting to know you. So I would absolutely say make sure to make that personal connection first. Um, um, and it's so I important. Can you that? Renee, yeah. for that, sorry to pause on this part. Now, because we don't have in-person meetings this year, because we are in 2020 and we are recording this in July um, in California. So um, for those who are listening, may have listened to this right now and thinking, well, I don't have an event to go to to meet you. What is like, a, what would you suggest as an alternative right now? So it's the great equalizer. I was actually talking about this with the president of the bar, Joanna Schiavone, the other day. Um, COVID has made sure that you don't have to have a ton of money to go to all the dinners or all the events to network. Everything's virtual. So mm -hmm. even though we can't meet in person, so for instance, if someone is watching this, you said you were going to put my email on the bottom, email me you know, um, or after a webinar, if you see me talking or we're both in the participants of a Zoom meeting, follow up and just say, hey, saw you, wanted to connect. That's great. Um, and especially when I'm sitting at home and I'm not having interaction with folks, I love that. I would love to take some time to talk to folks and, and uh, you know, have a glass of virtual wine or coffee with them. <laughs> that's, that's always something nice to do. And for those who are mentoring people, um, that's just because I had the com compound yes. question, you know? <laughs> yes. No, thank you for the kickstart. I forgot about that already. <laughs> uh, okay. So for those who are mentoring, I would say um, be, be kind, number one. I feel like we put an enormous amount of pressure on the law students and the new lawyers to 
do certain things to fit the mold that we did. So it, it must, it must be great because it worked for us. Um, and, and it doesn't work like that. You know, we can't tell people what to do, but we can give them options, I think. I would, and I would recommend that more than anything, which is someone comes to you and says, what should I do? It's the same thing I tell my clients. I can't tell you what to do. But what I can do is let you know path A, B, and C. Which one do you think will work for you? Um, because I think one of the problems in the legal profession that we perpetuate is that uh, there's only one way to be successful and that's, you know, it looks a certain way, it feels a certain way. And that's mm -hmm. definitely so far from the truth and it definitely doesn't foster a healthy uh, career. So mm -hmm. I think it's really important to make sure that people know there's a lot of different paths out there for them. So um, I know one of the things that you really care about that, um, let's talk about the MCLE that's M-S-H-E-L-E -E that you launch. Um, you had it for a while, I know that, because I seen it on your LinkedIn, but like, I think you're starting to put like YouTube videos out there. So I wanted to talk about that project and what, what it is, what you're envisioning it to be. And for anybody who want to check it out, what, what to expect. Sure. So I had this concept uh, in 2018, so a couple of years ago, that, um, there needed to be a little bit more candid programming to help women, uh, women of color, overcome hurdles in the legal profession. There is a lot of great programming out there. Most of it is geared to certain localities, right? Um, and there's some great statewide stuff too, like California Women Lawyers, but I wasn't seeing the topics that I wanted to see necessarily. And I wasn't seeing the, the really candid conversation. I was seeing a lot of women saying, you know, yay, go get them, Can, you know, and that's great and it has its place, but I feel like we need to talk about the stuff that's not so great too. We need to talk about what the problems are and mm -hmm. then we can talk about how we overcome them. So the goal for MCLE was to have people, these leaders in the profession, these people who have experienced the good and the bad, who overcome the good and the bad to talk about how they did it and what tips they would give people and to have these really candid conversations. So, you know, in the beginning it was trying to figure out how to get people into a um, studio to do the shoots. And, mm -hmm. uh, and it was such a struggle because I had a studio set up in Vista, which is an hour away from San Diego. Nobody wanted to come to Vista <laughs> and I don't blame them. <laughs> it's a it's long time. Out. This traffic is horrendous. Yeah. For those who may not be aware of why so they don't want to travel because if you're in going five south, <laughs> it's just like it's not fun. It's not fun. <laughs> so, you know, I I I kind of just I got busy with other things and said, oh, I'll do it later. I'll do it later. I'll do it later. I'll just do the Facebook page and post content about women lawyers, and then. Uh, about a month ago, my good friend, Lizette Herrera Castellanos, um, she called me and she said, I just don't understand why you're not doing anything with this. It looks so great. Uh, mm -hmm. I love your logo. I love all the work you've put into it. You're ready to go. Can you please just do something? And I said, you're right. I need to make space for this. And Zoom is made everybody so comfortable with being in different places and and doing presentations virtually, it was it was a perfect transition. So we kicked off in July, and we've recorded two free webinars so far. And we're we've got a calendar for once a week through the end of the year with different programs. So I'm really excited to see it happening. Renee said just for attorneys, so he said for law students, so he said for um, the, I mean your target is mostly attorneys. I get it, but for somebody who might be watching it and kind of thinking about it because. I do think there's some things our professions have a lot of overlap, like professional women, I mean women in bio and these other groups that are like scientist groups. And I see like overlap. So if anybody's watching something and they, is, are you doing any collaborations at all? Or is it just mostly for attorneys at this point? So the plan is definitely to have collaborations because I think that collaborating with other groups is so important. Mm -hmm. uh, and and it's not just for attorneys. In fact, I want to clarify too, it's MCLE and it's geared towards women lawyers, but everybody is welcome. 
to come and watch and learn about some of the struggles that women face in the profession. And it would probably be super helpful if some people who are not women watched the the programs so they could learn. Um, Because we are in the same ecosystem. I say this to people who are mentoring because I mentor guys and uh, I I mentor men and women both um, in certain, uh, in science, in law, and I see them as allies, right? I'm an ally and I see I tell people who might feel like, you know, we are like, when we say, oh, we are doing this and this, and it's a, like targeting them almost, but it's not if you see yourself as an ally and you could find out the information and kind of educate yourself instead of feeling defensive, because I mean, having an open discussion helps. That was so beautifully said. I mean, that's exactly it, right? It's that it's not, it's not an attack on men it's it's here's Mm -hmm. how here's some of the problems that maybe you haven't heard before uh, because someone didn't feel comfortable sharing them with you and that's that's one of the other benefits of mcle is that we do it via zoom webinar and no one can see the audience so no one has to know that you joined no one has to know (laughs) that you asked that question you know you have a lot of leeway to kind of take what you need which i really like but um but yes law students are welcome um legal secretaries and legal para, uh, paralegals. Yeah, I, I definitely want to work with a, a huge group of folks to to overcome a very systemic problem in our profession. And I I wanted to share why I, um, you know, I watched part of it. I haven't had a chance to fully watch the video you did on suicide awareness because attorneys are unfortunately one of the high suicide risk and I think that's really important discussion to have and I think this is why I asked if you're going to do some close cross collaboration because it's not just attorneys too there's also other you know professionals and other also um, people who are you know have suicidal ideation depression and a serious problem for everybody, right? Everybody in the ecosystem of what we call a community. So I think it's having these candid conversations, these tough conversations. And also um, when you watch these things, we also become aware of issues that we may not have thought about. So that's you know, my like to go watch that video. <laughs> thank you. And I think you're exactly right when it comes to uh, the crossover in stressful positions. I mean, one of the things, and the worst part of that entire video on my YouTube channel is me talking for the first five minutes on statistics. It's like the worst. I wish I could just cut that out and go straight into those women who participated, um, who are so thoughtful in their answers. So just really hang in there or fast forward and get past (laughs) that to, to the content. But one of the things we discovered while we were filming it was that they as MFTs or doctors felt very similarly to how I as a lawyer felt when Mm -hmm. we have so much, so many people counting on us. We have so much um, kind of responsibility on our shoulders. We found a lot of crossover. So I think exactly it does. It, It goes to other professions and we just have to be cognizant of this fact that we don't have to be perfect all the time. I'm so tired of that completely untenable, um, uh, I, I don't even know what the word is, the, it's placed on us that we have to be these perfect paragons all the time, can't ask for help, can't be tired, can't be, I mean, it's just, it's not real. can make a mistake. Can't make you a mistake, know, definitely not. It's like, um, so I think, um, I think that's, I, it's funny because I listen to a lot of different type of podcasts mostly about mindfulness and awareness um, these days, just because there's so much stress out. I'm just kind of trying to bring it in internally and work on myself. So um, so one of the podcasts I was listening to just today um, on Insight um, Sounds True Studio, they are posting it, and um, I will put the link down to it here. The, the guests they have had talk about it's being okay with being a B minus, doing something with it. <laughs> and I, I just stuck to, um, that just stuck to me because she said, instead of expecting to be a perfectionist, how about you aim, like you say, I'm okay with the B minus because you still get it done and your perfection is different for other pe- people who are looking at it. So 
you know, like when I put this YouTube channel together, I just put it out. And some of the videos in the beginning, I'm like, I, I cringe at it. Even now, sometimes I'm like, oh, I did that. But it's just being okay with it and just being uh, putting it out there because the content is really important to me and what I'm trying to build and what I'm trying to share and hopefully important to you. So uh, with that, um, we are almost running out of time. So I wanted to ask Renee, what do you do for your sanity? <laughs> this kind of like question I've been asking my guests about mindfulness. So like, how do you stay, stay true to yourself in your integrity and be grounded? So this is, this might sound funny, uh, but it is really, really rewarding to see a tangible result of your efforts immediately. Uh, and that's what makes me feel good and what makes me grounded. And so it's building things. I love saws. I love power tools. I love being able to um, go into my garage and build something and you can almost immediately get this result. It's not like trial work where two years later you may you know get in front of a jury it's right now today turning these materials into something i can use and it's just so rewarding and beautiful that's how i stay sane it's so funny but i'm laughing because i've seen you on facebook post like pictures how you've been doing a lot of gardening and upgrades to your place and you literally have like a rake <laughs> you know attack on your face <laughs> so I think somebody who's watching you right now they're like not envisioning you in doing power tools so I think it's uh, it's again don't judge a book by its cover you know <laughs> just be um, you know we all have our different things so with that I will put the information how to connect with Renee about her practice uh, about MCLE um, below so anybody who want to connect uh, thank you, Renee, for joining me today. I really appreciate your time. I know you're super busy and, you know, taking time out of your schedule. I appreciate it. And I am grateful you're supporting my community by joining us. Thank you so much for having me, my friend. I really appreciate it. Thank you. And then for those who joined, if you like this video, please share, like, subscribe and um, leave a comment. And until next time, we will see you. Bye.